Welcome to the Virtual Power Teams podcast, the number one podcast for working remotely and building powerful virtual teams. My name is Peter Ivanov, international keynote speaker and author of the book Virtual Power Teams, translated in six languages. Tune in every Tuesday for the very latest in virtual leadership or visit my website, peter-ivanov.com. Hi, everyone. To all listeners of the podcast Virtual Power Team, today we have a very exciting guest, Evelina Nikolova, and she's a senior manager. She's a global manager of a global technology company, and she, um, she leads global teams firsthand, really spread around the globe. I had the pleasure to meet her in uh, Bulgaria on an event of the outsourcing industry, and I was impressed by the example she gave me about multicultural teams, the exotic details, and uh, the ways she managed to resolve them. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to Evelina Nikolova. Welcome today. Our pleasure to be our guest. And Thank you. My Hi, first question to you is, who are you and what do you do? Um, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me uh, start with that. So um, I am a global manager in the technology services unit of the Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I have been uh, working there for the past close to 15 years, uh, working in a multicultural environment and for most of the time uh, leading, putting together and leading uh, multicultural teams. So um, I would think of myself as having a quite vast firsthand experience. <laughs> yes. Tell me, you know, having my experience in the past and leading some teams on three continents only, uh, Europe, Asia and Africa, sometimes it requires to sacrifice. Sometimes you have meetings in crazy hours, you have to travel, you fight jet lags. Sometimes you are not able to be with your friends as often as you wish because you have some events and commitments. Why do you do what you do? What gives you strength? What gives you wind in your sails to continue doing this for 15 years? And, and well, it's my job. Let's start with that. <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatic. What else? <clears throat> well, um, we have to understand the world as it is. Um, when I say it's my job, uh, it's the business these days. Uh, everything is global. Uh, our lives have turned more global than they have ever been. The businesses have become global. And we are not only talking global markets here, but also global um, human resource. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, because when you have, for example, um, customers in specific markets, you would like to have people working with those customers that are close to them, that can serve best their needs. Um, and when you set operations in those countries, you still have to make sure that um, the company directions are mm -hmm. uh, spread across all these um, uh, units that are in individual countries, that everybody's on the same page, that mm -hmm. you um, ensure that as a company, you provide consistent experience to your customers. Mm -hmm. So all this requires um, putting together, leading, driving um, international teams. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's fair. So the global market requires um global employee base because they could better yeah. address their needs but personally now to you what gives you strength on a personal level you know to to drive for this uh change if there is anything that you know um if you have some setbacks or you know right. the jet lag is kicking in but you still have to be in your best shape is, is there any secret well, secret is to, to be prepared for, <laughs> for what's to come, to know where you're going, to know the, the time difference, to be prepared for it, to have the right clothing for the climate and, and everything. But in general terms, um, it is quite fulfilling to, um, to interact with different cultures. And I'm not talking here only from business perspective, but mm -hmm. from even personal human perspective, um, if you think about it, when we visit countries as tourists, we see, we hear what tourists have to see and hear. Mm. When you interact with people, uh, with 
real life people, yes. you share their real life experiences mm -hmm. and you are no longer a tourist. Mm -hmm. You are then part of um, this world um, community, if mm -hmm. I can put it that way. Um, you understand what diversity there is in the world, not just of human beings and, and races and uh, cultures, uh, but also of opinions, attitudes, talent. Mm -hmm. And talent is um, as well uh, very critical for every business because you could use this talent. Uh, you can take it out of its local country box and you can use it at a global scale. And that's, in fact, the beauty of the global job. That Excellent. you could have access to a diverse talent, you can have the best of the world. Yes, and you had this chance firsthand to work with people I, from I, Asia I through Europe. Yes, um, so throughout uh, my career, I have managed uh, virtually every culture that is present uh, mm -hmm. or nation that is present on the uh, on the business map. Um, starting from the um, cultures from the Far East, uh, like mm -hmm. uh, Japan, um, China, mm -hmm. um, Singapore, Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, I have had teams there and peers there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then India, of course, uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, a big place for, uh, mm -hmm. for setting operations as well, mm -hmm. supporting the world. Going through the European countries and cultures then British culture, German, French, Dutch, mm -hmm. um, Central European uh, cultures, and then, of course, Poland, Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, going across Europe and, um, well, not to forget the mm -hmm. friends from the United States and uh, Latin America. So what's in the America's continent? So I've, I've touched mm -hmm. um, personally to nearly every culture, culture that's out mm -hmm. there. And this indeed requires sometimes uh, and quite often <laughs> long, long days. So my mm -hmm. days sometimes start at 7 a.m. and they end up as late as 10, 11 p.m. So it's not a 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. job, but um, it is, it's very, very fulfilling. And if just long hours is what it takes, then I am willing to. Mm -hmm. To, to put put to put the work and the so time. It's, it's really an honor to have you with us, having managed all possible <laughs> cultures on the business map, as you say. What is, from your experience, the number one challenge in leading global teams? All right. Uh, well, the number one challenge is to get the job done. <laughs> That's the number <laughs> one challenge of every manager. And um, the way I see it, um, every leader has two major tasks. Mm -hmm. The first task is to ensure individuals that they lead, so individuals under their leadership are productive, they understand mm -hmm. what they have to do, and they have the knowledge, skills, and the tool set to do it. And the number two challenge is to ensure that those individuals, they work actively together to uh, maximize the productivity and to deliver the result. Because the team productivity is not equal to individual productivity put together. Mm -hmm. The teamwork could actually be an outcome multiplier. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's much bigger than the individual productivity put together. Okay. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's a challenge. And with these objectives in mind, uh, I would say the biggest challenge to get the job done and having productive team in, in multicultural environment is the language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I say language, I am not talking just uh, the formally agreed language that we will exchange on. Mm -hmm. Well, in most uh, companies and in my company, that's English. So each mm -hmm. one of us or most people are not native English speakers. So the language itself and the level of uh, your um, ability to work with that language is different within a team. But I'm also talking all these different aspects of the language. Um, it's the variety of accents that you're going to get, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
uh, but it's um, to me the most important aspect of of the language language is this um, socio cultural bearing that the words the phrases even the modulation of the voice mm -hmm. have and mm -hmm. in the virtual environment um, in most cases people are just a voice over the phone or a voice over Skype we since recently have the beauty of video conferencing but this was mm -hmm. a modern technology just until a few years ago mm -hmm. Um, so people did not have the luxury of seeing your body language. So mm -hmm. to them, you are just the voice and they would assess you. And sometimes they would judge you based on, um, on your language. They could think of you of um, um, aggressive or conforming. They could think of you as kind or offensive, mm -hmm. agreeable or challenging, and that in many cases may not reflect your actual personality. It mm -hmm. would be just a perception. Mm -hmm. So um, people have to be, and well, leaders, but also individuals in a multicultural teams have to be very mindful that, um, very mindful of their language and how they, they, they sound. Mm -hmm. So from leader standpoint, the challenge is um, that, and how they overcome is in terms of personal productivity to make sure that each individual team member, no matter of their level of understanding of the language, mm -hmm. their background and what they see as culturally acceptable or not, they understand the task in hand. Mm -hmm. They understand what they have to do. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a common setting with a team, you could explain to everyone what needs to be done and I can tell that people may, may get it differently. Mm -hmm. So um, um, you would ask, of course, whether everybody knows what, what they need to do. Everybody would say yes. Uh, but in many cases, in, and particularly, well, more often mm -hmm. <laughs> in Asian cultures, um, they would say yes. Mm -hmm. But yes does not necessarily mean yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not have fully understood. Um, you. Uh, the Western cultures would ask follow-up questions that will not shy away from follow-up mm -hmm. questions just to make sure they understand. But for Asians coach, Asian cultures, uh, they would refrain from asking too much questions because that mm -hmm. would mean that you have not explained properly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they don't want to make you think that you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Um, leaders have to be mindful of that and just to make sure that they they ask follow-up questions just to make sure that everybody's on the same page everybody understands the task in hand and when then it gets to the team dynamic um a leader should get their team to work together with mm -hmm. each other uh, very often um leaders are and managers uh, are mindful that yeah this the people they have different dynamics some are faster some are slower and maybe the safest way and the way to be in the loop at all time is to channel every communication through themselves mm -hmm. but this is killing the team dyna dynamics mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. my approach has always been for the people to work together mm -hmm. and people have this emotional intelligence they are mm -hmm. smart they are intuitive they mm -hmm. find ways Mm -hmm. to get through the cultural challenge, mm -hmm. to get through the cultural specifics and to develop this emotional sensitivity to speak to each other in appropriate language. Mm -hmm. So at the end, we not only get the work done, but we develop this team spirit, this mm -hmm. uh, support structure, mm -hmm. and uh, people start to collaborate in much better manner Compared to if co compared to if you, their leader, mm -hmm. uh, channeled everything through yourself and and keep control of everything. So mm -hmm. to me, mm -hmm. that's that's in fact any... the biggest challenge and how I address it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you thank you for the rich kind of um, 
mentioning so many different aspects and, and tools. And you mentioned at some point in time that uh, one of the key roles of the leader is to make sure that one plus one plus one is much more than three. Mm-hmm. And the more numbers, you know, you have a team productivity. What would be your tip, particularly in a multicultural environment? Uh, you said if you set the right tone, you know, people would find a way to speak to each other. But is there anything specific that you could do to ensure that particularly in a multinational teams, one plus one plus one is is bigger or much bigger than three? Um, yes. And mm-hmm. uh, when we put team t- teams together, we don't, of course, consider only their um, cultural background or the scope of customers or, or work they are supposed to do. Um, we have to make sure that they get something out, out of it, out mm-hmm. of this uh, engagement, out of this team, if you will, um, that they will have, they will come out of it uh, better, smarter. Um, they will have more opportunities. Mm-hmm. So when we put together teams, uh, we select them in a way that they are that they are not alike. They have mm-hmm. uh, different skills yeah. uh, and they have the ability to learn from each other, even if starting from a common base and have gaps in their knowledge through working together, they enrich their own experience. And when you get smarter, when you mm-hmm. start having access to um, to more information, to more insights, your bubble grows. Mm-hmm. And when your bubble grows, uh, your touch point to the world becomes be, become more. Mm-hmm. You start generating more ideas, and um, and it's like an yeah. like a, a snowball. It, it it grows, it grows, and at the end, you've started with scope this big. Yes. You had this idea. Yes. At the end, it turns into something yes. big and powerful and fantastic Excellent. in most cases. Excellent. So it's about individual growth that you provide. It's about leveraging on the strengths of, uh, of, of the people oh, yeah. when you select the team. Absolutely, and, absolutely. Yeah. For all of us, every day should be a school day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the listeners know from virtual power teams the way that everyone is a star and we discover the natural strengths okay. and talents and we amplify it in a team through the common goal and supporting each other. So this is pretty much in line with what we said so far. Tell me now, what is the most exciting first hat experience that you had with some cultures that you worked? The most exciting, oh my God, there are so many in this category. Um, <laughs> so every experience, <laughs> yeah, every, every experience is exciting. There are some funny experience and some memorable experience. So mm-hmm. maybe I can give examples yeah. in each category. So fun, funny, fun experiences. Um, well, uh, at the beginning of my journey as, uh, uh, a leader of international teams, um, I had been assigned a team in, uh, in Shanghai, China, mm-hmm. and it was an already set up team of individuals. They were at the time, uh, material planners, cause I was in charge of the, um, planning and supply chain management of, uh, uh, of the company I was working for. And um, I thought, um, I was not very familiar at first with the Asian culture. It was my first touch, first experience uh, related to that. So um, I knew the, the power of preparation. So I read what needs what, how I need to, to act, what I should expect, and so mm-hmm. on. And I thought it would be a great idea to have a, a video conference just to meet the team so that they could see me, I could see them, and we have a more um, personalized experience because travel was not possible at the time. So um, here we are setting uh, the, um, uh, the video conference and I introduce myself, I say all the right words, um, I talk about myself, I talk about my family, because uh, in Asia in particular, mm-hmm. you have to review some background about yourself, your, your family situation, and so on, so that people can relate to you. And uh, so 
there was, I finished presenting myself and uh, they had to speak up and somebody who dared to speak, um, they, they said, um, hello, welcome to the team, Evelina. You have beautiful hair. And then the <laughs> other one um, just um, chimed in and, and they said, uh, you have a very pretty dress. And I was just, I was <laughs> smiling there and I was like, how do you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I say, well, thank you. And, uh, and, and, and I, I, well, I try to get out of this situation, said, mm -hmm. what are they doing? <laughs> and why, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to react in such situation? Because mm -hmm. in, in our culture, in our part of the world, your business partner or mm -hmm. your Mm -hmm. managers you don't talk to them about appearance yes but in 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 china for example this is a way to make you feel comfortable to make mm -hmm. you feel good about yourself so they mm -hmm. started to compliment my my appearance because that was a a, a, a polite thing for them to do mm -hmm. and uh and that was that was funny <laughs> were so, they men mo mostly no no it was the girls in fact who started mm -hmm. uh, but, but still it it was quite mm -hmm. awkward for me Mm -hmm. um, and I have another um, experience, which was funny as well. And in this situation, it was not just me who, who screwed up. It was everyone <laughs> from the Western world. So we were visiting um, Japan. We were meeting their business partners. And uh, we were on our side, a group of people, maybe four people, including myself. Uh, the rest were all Westerns. And uh, so we were visiting uh, Japan and we have been given very precise instructions, how to behave, how to greet, what outfit to wear. So we have received every instruction possible. We complied, of course. Um, so we are going there, entering a, a room, a meeting room and sitting on the meeting table. And each of us had assigned seat. So the boss, the most senior in mm -hmm. our group should sit at the front of the table and then next to him should sit the next in line mm -hmm. in the hierarchy uh, and then in this order, the rest. So, um, and if people are on, at the same level, but they are men, they should sit mm -hmm. closer to the boss mm -hmm. and the women should sit farther from the boss. So we sat on our assigned seats and I realized in a moment that I am sitting just under the air, condi air conditioning vent and I was freezing. Mm -hmm. So um, our manager, who was an American at the time, so he was sitting at the farthest side of the table and the air, the, the fresh air didn't, wasn't reaching him. So he noticed that I'm cold and he suggested that we swap seats. And said, yeah, sure, thank you. So we stood up and, and started to swap seats and to rearrange the order in the table. And the Japanese people, they panicked. They said, <laughs> no, 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 you, you, you cannot do that. I said, no, no, we are, we are okay. We'll just change seats because we explained why we are doing it. And they said, no, 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 you, you cannot do that. It's not how it's done here. <laughs> I said, oh, come on. I, I simply cannot sit. And we expected a long meeting. So I said, I cannot sit two hours under this air conditioning. I will not be functional tomorrow. And my boss said, yeah, and I cannot be sitting in the corner and sweating. So yeah, we are, we are definitely swapping. So this, this threw a complete chaos for a few minutes in the room. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, well, we, they tolerated us. They said, oh, these foreigners, they have no manners. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> so we continued with our meeting. And afterwards, we were explained what we did and to never, ever consider doing this thing ever again. And then I realized with all this experience that uh, experiences that no matter how much you read, no matter how much you prepare, nothing can prepare you for the very situational um, mm -hmm. um, aspect of it, because you will know in general what to do, what to not do, what to say, what to not say. But when you get into the, the this mm -hmm. just mundane situations, then you are very likely to not 
do the right thing. Yes. So, so we all learn through this experience and I'm just sharing it's a, it's <laughs> fun stuff. You, yeah. No, fantastic. It was like a movie. <laughs> it was running in my head. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Just now you have a unique chance to lead all possible cultures, you know, from Far East through Europe, yes. through uh, Latin America. Give us a short overview. What is specific about, you know, many companies, many of the listeners would mm -hmm. have to probably work with, with Indians, uh, with um, Chinese to some extent as a partners. Now uh, we have uh, European customers considering near shoring versus offshoring. That's a separate question by itself. Right. But European cultures in Latin America, if you want to follow the sun and serve global customers 24 hours, you would need probably a free footprint in, in all um, you know, big time zones. So tell us about the specifics and also some tips. How can you overcome them? How, what can you do practically in order to you know, navigate in this global map of cultures right well um that question is always a, a, a tricky one and uh i i would like to avoid falling into stereotypes and to over generalize uh, with the world becoming global and it's not just the business that's becoming global it's the media it's the social network um, we are more than ever before exposed to foreign cultural, foreign cultural influence. Um, we have developed our own insights, our own observations, and they are acquired through mostly through informal channels these days. So, um, we are not talking any more clear cut, uh, cultural specifics, because with all this immigration, with all this globalization of the media, um, the lines have blurred. Mm -hmm. And um, there are many studies and professional literature that's dedicated to cultural specifics. And they tend to put entire country populations in behavioral buckets. Uh, we have heard of um, Asian cultures, for example, being very traditional and hierarchic. Um, Scandinav uh, Scandinavians are um, collectivistic, Americans are individualistic, they are direct, and almost everything is a business transaction there. So um, again, these days with all the, the influence we get through formal and informal channels, um, these lines have blurred. So um, still, when you have an international team around you, um, in a conference table or in Zoom, as it is prevailing now, nowadays, um, you should be considerate of certain things. For example, um, I just am searching for ways to, to make it more practical. Um, as, a, as a leader or even a team member, of an international team, you have to make sure that, for example, you start the meeting with an intro or a small talk that everybody on the table can relate to. Weather, for example, has always been a safe shot. Uh, these days, COVID updates by country <laughs> have successfully replaced it. So um, in general, it's not, uh, um, it's not a strange thing that we all talk about that. It's because yeah. everybody on the table can relate to these particular topics and you will not have anyone behind not knowing what to say. So make sure you start with that. Then um, one has to make sure that they encourage their team members from um, Japan and, and China to speak up as they may be shy to express their own opinion in front of everybody. Usually these cultures are... Um, are much more, uh, in a way, careful about um, about what they say, and they rarely talk without being asked. So you have to be mindful of that. Uh, you have to be ready to cut off the team members from India when they talk too much mm -hmm. and they try to dominate the conversation because over there, it's, uh, in a way, it's cultural to become, uh, to make yourself more visible. 
uh, more noticed, to, to be perceived as uh, knowledgeable, smarter, having an opinion. So you may tend to, to talk and talk and talk. Mm -hmm. um, so one has to be ready to cut them off and, and give the word to somebody else. Um, you have to get back the conversation on track when the experts from Singapore and from Indonesia uh, get any process discussion in the weeds and start digging into the tiniest detail, um, you should specifically ask uh, the representatives from Scandinavia whether, uh, whether they agree with the general approach, whether they are comfortable with the decisions made uh, during the meeting, just to make sure that they, they are committed to what uh, you as, as team have decided. Uh, you have to regularly uh, remind the colleagues from the United States when they start throwing jokes, for example, or, or jargon that only they can understand. Uh, they have to start speaking more universally understood language. Um, and um, eventually you, um, you could ask how to celebrate potentially any good results in a way that will make all the people happy. Uh, you could ask for creative ideas uh, from the people from Latin America. They are uber creative about mm -hmm. uh, ways to celebrate. Um, so you have to be mindful of the tendencies that different cultures may have mm -hmm. just to maintain the consistency and the dynamic uh, in the conversation and to get the best of it and to get people equal chance and opportunity to um, to speak up and to give them voice. At the end, do not forget to issue clear communications with agreements, next steps, and owners to document them and to distribute, preferably by email, mm -hmm. just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, regardless of where they are coming from. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, <laughs> So that's a more practical side of it that uh, that I follow in my um, in my daily practice. Excellent, excellent. We had a blog around uh, how to deal with accents and language yeah. barriers. So there were a number of tips, and you mentioned this is the language as a number one challenge. So let's look now. Many companies, particularly in Europe, with uh, head office in Europe, they are considering should they go near so near shore you know outsourcing to european locations central europe or offshore or far shore like far east from your perspective because you are not just manager and team lead uh, successfully managing global teams but you are driving a business transformation so on the next level transforming the business uh, what will be the considerations and pros and cons for near shore versus far or offshore Well, the considerations for the businesses um, have become more and more um, where they can find uh, reliable, um, skilled, knowledgeable resources. Mm -hmm. um, the industry has become the industry of knowledge. It's not just... Um, you know, the horsepower <laughs> that you need to have, like many people and throw many people just to do a work, but to do it in a smarter way, in a more optimized way. So this has shifted uh, the preferences for uh, of multiple companies to where to, to outsource their business. Um, there are also other considerations like uh, purely ethical considerations. Uh, we have had many examples in the past of um, companies, for example, that outsourced their businesses to Far East and uh, they got their product in and their brands in, in the spotlight for the wrong reasons, like... Uh, um, human exploitation, um, environmental impact, and, and so on. So um, companies have become more thoughtful and more considerate of the 
ethical aspect of uh, doing their business. So with all that, uh, they are more selective of the locations that they are choosing to, 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 to put operations mm -hmm. in. Uh, while the operational work could still go to India and China, for example, uh, they would apply better governance, more control over there. Um, but at the same time, they started to consider locations that were not on top of their list in the past. Mm -hmm. um, uh, locations more and more situated in Europe, in Central Europe, in Eastern Europe. Um, why lately? Because um, more and more uh, there we have young, um, talented and very educated workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, workforce that has good cultural experience as well, because now young people can easily travel uh, more than any time in the past. Um, they are uh, usually very technologically savvy. Mm -hmm. uh, they have um, good education. They speak good English and at least one or two other foreign languages besides their own. So all that put together made those made locations like um, for example, Czech Republic, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, more attractive compared to they have been 20 years ago. And more and more we, we see shift of uh, activity from Far East where you can, we, you, you have no choice but having to manage extensive workforce, putting night shifts in order to be able to cover the globe, uh, deal with uh, huge people turnover, you could still do that if it, it fits your agenda at the end of the day and your business model. But more and more companies are now turning towards near shore locations that are more familiar, more close, easier to travel to, easier to communicate. And uh, in many cases, even uh, they have geographic and, and also cultural proximity. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So... Let's be a bit more magical here. Is there a secret? Do you have a secret to lead global teams? Something that is your kind of special power or special right. advice? <laughs> My superpower. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, well, um, secret probably is not a secret. It's, uh, it's my personal philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, so my personal philosophy for building and leading strong and successful cross-cultural teams, it consists of few fundamental rules. Mm -hmm. um, number one rule is do not see race, color, or background. Um, treat every person as human being. Understand what is important for them, what matters in their lives, what makes them tick. Um, number Two, rule number two is be open, transparent, and fair. Mm -hmm. The more you present that, the more you will receive the same back. Mm -hmm. people, will, people will open up, they'll start sharing more with that. They'll give you more feedback, more insights that you can utilize to become a better leader. Um, rule number three to me is encourage people to collaborate effectively. So I uh, mentioned uh, this briefly earlier, but one should resist the temptation to channel every communication through themselves. Yes, you are on top of everything. Yes, you know what's going on at any given moment, but this removes the autonomy from the people. Uh, this makes them less thoughtful, less proactive and more reactive, less insightful. Um, and at the end, it creates more work for, for you and it creates more limitations to the team rather than unleashing their potential. And the last rule, so four, rule, four mm -hmm. rules, uh, the last rule to me is give everyone in the team equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say that, I view it holistically. So opportunity to, of expression, to express themselves as they feel comfortable, to voice their opinion as they see comfortable, to participate. If they don't do it voluntarily, you have to nudge them a little bit to, mm -hmm. 
to start participating and also the opportunity to learn and to grow. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, you have at the end, that, that's to me the recipe of a successful team, mm -hmm. a team where everybody feels like they are contributing, everybody is engaged with uh, what they have to accomplish, everybody knows wh where they are going and what's in it for them. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing your philosophy. It's very powerful. Um, you know, the listeners know the 10 big rocks, the virtual power teams, which is another system, not a philosophy personal. Uh, let me ask you this. If you can give only one advice to a leader who starts now leading a global or a team with many cultures represented, what would that be? Well, one advice, um, just understand that leading cross-culturally is not straightforward. It is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. um, if I have to give one advice, it would be invest in education. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I say education, I mean education about key cultural aspects without mm -hmm. overgeneralizing, mm -hmm. um, learn jokes mm -hmm. that are appropriate for each culture. They could easily be used as icebreakers without risking offending someone. Mm -hmm. um, learn the do's and the don'ts mm -hmm. uh, in the way you communicate um, and I have had, for example, personal experiences, uh, per personal experience of being seen as overly aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably because I, I tend to talk too much, but <laughs> and also just repeating things just to make sure that everybody understands. Mm -hmm. uh, but this has been seen of, by certain cultures as being too in a way, pushy or aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I've learned from that. So I learned because I accept that I'm not probably educated enough. I have not educated myself enough and have not mm -hmm. developed this cultural sensitivity that I should mm -hmm. have at a higher level. So these are the, the, the aspects related to, to education that I had in mind. Mm -hmm. On top of that, of course, you should add ethics and mm -hmm. fairness. Mm -hmm. um, we should not forget that regardless of the cultural differences between us uh, and the members of our multicultural teams, we are dealing with human beings. We mm -hmm. should treat each other with the respect, with the care, with the attention and the empathy because these are universal. So um, they, they go beyond and cross cultural boundaries. So um, we have to treat each other like humans. Human beings, yeah, human. Yes. Fantastic. So last question to you. Um, now COVID made us more remote with the lockdowns working from home, we have to work more remotely and virtually. Considering COVID, but even beyond, uh, what do you think is the future of virtual teams? Well, it's bright. <laughs> virtual <laughs> teams have bright future. Bright future. Uh, <laughs> we should expect them uh, to see them more and more. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, um, and I'm probably not uh, not giving like any information that's not uh, has not come to mind to everyone, but uh, or revealing secret there. Due to this pandemic, this is going to have a long-term effect on how we work, um, how we interact with each other. We have started and will continue to experience um, virtual teams on international level uh, and also on local level. Mm -hmm. So every team that was previously local we used to see them in the office, has now turned into virtual team. Um, this pandemic uh, got many companies to revisit their um, operating models. Like they discovered that people could work 
productively at home. They could collaborate productively at home. They can be engaged properly at home. Um, many surveys uh, have been um, run that show exact those results. So um, we believe that, well, leaders, and I'm part of some leaders forums as well within the technology industry, mm -hmm. Um, we believe that um, more and more we will rely on, on virtual teams to get the work done. Mm -hmm. um, and this gets us to face a different challenge. So um, not all the leaders have this ability to, to manage remotely, to manage virtually. And uh, this will require for all managers and also for all people leaders to step up their skills, to, um, to change their mindset, to develop new sensitivity, to, to, to equip themselves with a new toolkit that will help them to manage effectively in a virtual environment. Because that's, that's going to be a future uh, short-term mid-term <laughs> and uh, potentially long-term. This is where we are going. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Bright future for virtual teams. Leaders <laughs> need to upskill. <laughs> Thank you for all your insights from the practice by leading global teams, invest in education, prepare well, and treat people as human beings with all the fairness mm. reality, not just as an expert. So it was a pleasure having you, Evelina. Good luck in your global journey. Uh, and thanks for sharing your insight with us today. Thank you, Peter. And um, thank you for having me again. It's been a pleasure and uh, wish you every success. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Big virtual power hack from oh, us, thank you. <laughs> Evelina and Peter. <laughs> and uh, yes, tune in next Tuesday. <laughs>